Hey there, listeners. This is Rod Gerardo, research resident at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And whether you're watching us on YouTube, listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, the best way to listen is on the Stay Current Pediatric Surgery app. It's brought to you by Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, Children's Mercy at Kansas City, and the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. It's in the Apple App Store, it's in the Google Play Store. Download it today, but until then, enjoy the episode. On this podcast, we don't usually shy away from controversy. So keeping with that, today's topic has a little bit of nuance, tracheomalacia. And we're gonna hear from an expert, Dr. Dan Von Allman. He's the surgeon in chief at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And here he is talking about tracheomalacia during a webinar from this past year from the Aerodigestive Center. So without further ado, let's kick things off. Dr. Von Allman, what is tracheomalacia? Uh, the tracheomalacia is abnormality of the tracheal cartilage. And uh, oftentimes you'll see this in posterior wall intrusion that will, um, in many times, will co-apt with the anterior wall of the trachea. The way that we treat tracheomalacia has changed over time. The classic teaching is that don't worry about it, kids will grow out of it. And I remember being taught that as a fellow. But now there are new theories to suggest that even asymptomatic patients may have long-term pulmonary consequences from tracheomalacia. So how do we decide which ones we wanna treat? Well, to answer that, why don't we go through a case? A 37 week uh, infant with a chromosomal abnormality, uh, coded on induction for a G-tube, he failed extubation, airway evaluation had 95% tracheal collapse, and there was a nominate artery compression of the trachea. So what would be the next step in the workup? Well, we're gonna start off with this image that you see right here. This is an inspiratory expiratory CT scan. You can see some compression right here at the level of the aortic arch. And then from this imaging, we're gonna get some recons. And then this is the airway reconstruction. And uh, as you can see in this, the majority of the trachea is, uh, looks pretty good. But as you can see, there's some pretty significant compression in the expiratory recon, and that's right at the level of the aortic arch. So this is a child that we would approach with an aortopexy. At Cincinnati Children's, they do this thoracoscopically. And what's the basic concept? Fortunately, in babies, they usually have a large thymus. You take that thymus out, it gives you space, and then you can elevate the compressing vascular structure off of the interior wall of the trachea. Now, here's an image of the positioning. The child is mostly supine here. But with the uh, left side elevated slightly, I usually approach these from the left side, and we'll get into it later. But um, if it's going to be combined, because there's some kids who really have an indication for both an a anterior and a posterior approach, we would approach those from the right side to do the aortopexy and a posterior tracheopexy at the same time thoracoscopically. All right, let's get to the good part. This is the technique video. We use the, the uh, bipolar sealer in babies to mobilize thymus uh, with the lung uh, collapse just with a little bit of positive pressure. We don't do a complete thymectomy, but I, if you can't just push the thymus out of the way, which I find that frequently you can't, you need to resect probably the right most of the right half of the thymus. Obviously, you want to be care careful to avoid the front nerve, which is in the bottom part of the um, scope view there. And going up superiorly, uh, you want to identify the vein, and then I'll mobilize it uh, medially over to the, um, so that you have a clear view of the posterior um, table of the sternum so that when you put the stitches in, and I tend to pass the stitches either through the sternum or around the sternum in an older child and tie them on top of the sternum rather than trying to put the stitch in the, in the uh, periosteum of the sternum posteriorly because I think that's uh, very likely just to tear out. Keep in mind, multiple surgeons were on this webinar. So here's Dr. Mike Rudder, who's the director of the Aero Digestive Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. It's worth noting that the thymectomy really is key. And so if you've got a kid with the George, you don't have much of a thymus and you don't have much room and an aortopexy is much less likely to be successful. 
It's a good point. And we have had kids where you look at the preoperative CT scan and you uh, there's actually very little um, uh, space to pull things forward or backwards. And those are kids that we struggle with in terms of how to approach them. Some of them we've actually used a combined thoracoscopic and cervical approach to provide sufficient mobilization to um, to get that done. So that's mobilizing the thymus. Once that's mobilized, then the next step is to identify the aortic innominate junction. Then we're gonna open the pericardium. Our technique uh, is to mobilize down to the arch so that we can clearly see the arch and the innominate. I then open the pericardium with the reflection down onto the arch so that I can see. And I put the stitches in right at the, um, right at the reflection where it fans out onto the vessel and you can get a really good bite of the um, tissue that will hold, uh, holds well and gives you uh, the ability to pull all of those mediastinal structures anteriorly uh, without uh, or minimizing the risk that the suture is actually going to pull through. I think on this view you can see, the, it's a little bit hard to see, but just down here is the reflection you can see there, the reflection of the uh, pericardium down onto the aorta. Next, we're gonna pass some transsternal sutures. There are lots of different ways to do that. So whatever your favorite technique is for getting a big needle into a small baby and then put those stitches in. Um, again, I make the fellows put the stitch right on the wall of the aorta as that uh, pericardium reflects down onto the vessel wall. Very cool surgery, but as we mentioned in the beginning, that positioning is very important. And sometimes whether you go through the right or the left depends on what else you have to do thoracoscopically. Which brings up another question. Who of these patients needs a posterior tracheopexy? Certainly most, if not everyone on the call, uh, knows Rusty Jennings and Rusty, very innovative uh, surgeon. Um, they, you guys, Ben, reported this series with 118 patients with improved respiratory parameters. Uh, Post-op, you have definitely have a referral population. So there's one study on one end of the spectrum saying that most patients probably need it. Then you can go to the other extreme. The other end of the spectrum is uh, a good friend, Steve Rothenberg, who has done also, in fact, he did the first thoracoscopic esophageal atresia repair, done 145 cases, only four required an aortopex, and he didn't do any uh, tracheopexies, posterior tracheopexies. And lastly, Dr. Vanderzee, who has some data to suggest maybe somewhere in the middle. Some patients do, some patients don't. Obviously, it depends on, on how you measure that and what is the technique, the bronchoscopic technique that you use to measure the amount of malacia. This is Dr. Titgott from um, the Netherlands, Stefan Titgott, who, who presented this paper in, that was published in JPS in the anterior spinal ligament to the posterior trachea membrane. Um, and he says that it adds about, uh, with four stitches, adds about 12 to 18 minutes to the operation. And they do them in all of those patients with moderate to severe tracheomalacia. Here are some examples of indications that the Cincinnati Children's Group uses. Primarily is obviously that if you're there and you do the dissection, the trachea is sitting right there. And so it's to David's point, it's not that uh, it doesn't add that much time to put those stitches in um, to pex the trachea posteriorly, then do the esophageal anastomosis in front of it. And then if there's evidence of tracheal lumen compromise beyond the great vessels, or if there's continued malacia after the aortopexy. Here's another video by the Cincinnati Children's team about a patient who had significant tracheal malacia, who then got a posterior tracheopexy. Did this thoracoscopically, which was very helpful because of his age and his size. It, it uh, dramatically improved his recovery time. And um, from an operative standpoint, it was a lot easier. So, Dr. Von Allman, do you always have to take the azygous vein? I've found that most of these posterior tracheopexies, you can get all the way down to carina uh, without dividing the azygous. Download the Stay Current Pediatric Surgery app to watch the entire video of how the Cincinnati Children's team does this posterior tracheopexy. So, despite advances in the diagnosis and treatment of tracheomalacia since Dr. Von Allman was a fellow, it seems like there are still some unanswered questions. Some of them are listed here. I mean, what about criteria for who needs this surgery? 
and what technology is out there that could help us in the future. Well, the future might be today. This scan is impressive. As you can see, the proximal pouch is in green. The trachea is in, obviously in green uh, as well, but going down to the to the carina. And you can see the, the dramatic acute angulation of the trachea that's caused by that um, distended or dilated proximal, thickened proximal pouch. That's right, neonatal MRI is changing the game with how we diagnose these airway disorders. Some of these can even be done in real time as the patient is breathing. That's this one here. I'm actually particularly excited about this because you get uh, real-time visualization of what the, um, or dynamic visualization of what the trachea looks like and that we may be able to uh, develop some objective measures of tracheal um, intrusion from the posterior wall that will help us to decide which kids need what operation. So in summary, the old school teaching that tracheal malacia will just go away, so don't worry about treating it, that's out. Now, we're starting to look at ways that we can treat these patients because there are probably some long-term sequelae pulmonary-wise for these patients who are even asymptomatic when they present. And then as far as treatment goes, we can do a lot of things minimally invasively, thoracoscopic. That includes aortopexies or sometimes posterior tracheopexies. And the way that we decide which patient needs which procedure, that's gonna vary based on a lot of factors. But maybe with advances in new technology, not only will we be able to identify those patients that necessitate specific procedures, but we'll be able to do them better more accurately, more efficiently. So thanks, Dr. Von Allman. Thank you to the Air Digestive team at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. If you want more educational content like this, look no further than the 2021 Pediatric Surgery Update course. You can sign up at globalcastmd.com. It's August 27th. It'll be webinars and talks just like this from pediatric surgeons around the world, but it's interactive. So you can talk to them about cases, procedures, research, anything you want. Follow us on social media, follow us and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, I'm Rod from Cincinnati Children's. And remember, knowledge should be free.